Hello and welcome to episode 215 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. This week, powerful tornadoes destroyed several wind turbines in Iowa. But boy, did they ever produce a lot of electricity just before they collapsed. A new survey suggests that about half of U.S. voters support criminal charges against oil companies who deceive the public about climate change. And in a related survey... 90% of hockey fans support criminal charges against the referees in the Stanley Cup playoffs. A hockey reference, wow! The the Maritime Court finds greenhouse gases or marine pollution. It's a big win for small island states threatened by sea level rise, but terrible for court sonographers when seas are rough. See, Maritime Court, do you get it? Yeah. The courthouse would be on a boat, assumably, and never mind. Never mind. Yeah. As the U.S. looks to impose increased tariffs on Chinese EVs, China plans to retaliate with increased tariffs on blue jeans, rock and roll, and mom's apple pie. All that and more on this edition of the Clean Energy Show. And also on this week's show, a criminal case has been filed against the CEO and directors of the French oil company Total Energies, alleging its fossil fuel exploitation has contributed to the deaths of victims of climate-fueled extreme weather disasters. China's emissions could, could be in permanent decline right now. That's amazing. Uh, Why dead monkeys are falling out of trees in Mexico? Not so amazing. Uh, Chinese automaker BYD already has 100 stores in Brazil, and India is going crazy, crazy this year with solar. Just nuts. Yeah. I saw on Instagram you were at a film festival. Yeah, I was at the Yorkton Film Festival, which is in its 77th year now. This is the oldest film festival in North America. It's in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, Canada, near where James and I live. And I've been going since the mid-1980s and, and spent the weekend there. And uh, as always, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. So they still have that thing where you shoot? Yeah. So uh, you you drink a lot of beer and then you go uh, skeet shooting, which is one of their events. Uh, Although this year, for the first time, they actually put up signs, uh, please don't drink before you go shoot with the guns, which they've never done before. I don't know. Perhaps How many years has this been going on? They finally put up the do not drink before shooting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, at least a dozen years. But of course, uh, that's one of the things that makes it fun. So years ago, James and I had the pleasure of opening the festival with our feature film that we made. And that was a, a huge amount of fun. And this year's opening night film, I just wanted to mention quickly, it's called Wilfred Buck, and it's directed by Lisa Jackson. Uh, I saw Lisa's first short film about 20 years ago. We were in a festival together, and uh, I've been following her career since then, so it was great to see her come back. Was it a short film that let off the festival? Because ours was a feature. No, they always have a feature film for the opening night, so Uh this is a feature documentary. And I mention it because it's a great film, but also there's a clean energy connection. Really? Um, We talk about on the show, you know, Canada has a lot of clean or really technically low carbon electricity in the form of uh, hydroelectric power. This is going back decades. We've had quite a bit of that, and particularly in Manitoba. So the film is about Wilfred Buck, who's an indigenous man from northern Manitoba, and this is the dark side of those hydroelectric powers. We often talk about how, you know, there is an environmental cost to putting up hydropower, but, you know, often it was decades ago, and, you know, these things have been kind of running smoothly, so sometimes we forget. But Wilfred Buck and his family were from northern Manitoba, and, you know, they and many other indigenous people in the area basically made their living off the river in northern Manitoba that, you know, in the 60s, they decided to dam it up, kick everyone off the land, and and create this hydroelectric dam, which, you know, has provided a lot of clean power, but we often forget there's a social and environmental cost to all of this. And, you know, that combined with the other terrible policies of the Canadian government really led to many, many hardships for the uh, Indigenous people. And and Wilfred Buck, you know, his family from that point really kind of scattered, and and he was the only one really to, um, you know, make it out alive. And uh, so he's had an amazing life. He's written a a memoir, and the film is kind of based on his memoir. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a it's a it's a really great film and an inspiring story and if anybody wants to know more about you know the the way Canada has treated its indigenous people this is a a great place to start I can't believe you went to the Yorkton Film Festival and came back with a clean energy story I mean I know that's pure luck 
Because you're going to talk about it, it anyway. It's what you did on the weekend, right? So, I mean. I, I was going to talk about it anyway. So, <laughs> the film's not uh, streaming anywhere yet. It's going to play. It's brand new. It's going to play at the Hot Docs Festival in about a month. And we'll probably be streaming after that. There's a great website, by the way. Do you use justwatch.com? Have you ever seen that? No. If you're ever looking, there's a movie you want to watch, and you're not sure where to find it because there's all these different streaming services. Yeah. You go to justwatch.com, you put in the title, and Wilford Buck is listed there, and you can set a notification because it's not streaming right now. Huh. But you can set a notification, and once it arrives somewhere, it'll tell you, oh, it's on Disney Plus, or oh, it's on Just Watch. Uh, Netflix. Or Just Watch? Just Watch. Okay. Dot com, and there's, there's an app as well, so I I keep a list there of a bunch of movies I want to watch. Yeah, that's like, And it's tailored to every country because, of course, it might be on Netflix well, in one great. country but not another. Yeah, because we don't, yeah. we usually see the American versions of when things are coming in. It's always disappointing because we have, you know, different licensing things, things that are on Netflix in the US or Hulu or yeah. we don't get them here necessarily. And sometimes we get but things yeah, that it, they don't get. So it works both ways. This but. is tailored to every country. I'm not sure if they do every country on earth, but, uh, but yeah, Wilford Buck great film how long have you been using that app is it it's not going to go away anytime soon it's like no it's a... been a couple of years now yeah it's super helpful okay well i was outside minding my own business the other day when the pipeline plane flew over and i have a clip of that we're talking about it on the show if you're watching on the youtube channel you'll be able to see it this is flying at low altitude right over my house it buzzes it sometimes daily sometimes weekly but they're looking for leaks in the pipeline that is adjacent to my backyard fence and there's there's multiple pipelines back there some of them actually the oil pipeline is the least dangerous this is the ones that have sort of gases that would leak as a gas that's heavier than air and they would sort yeah. of uh, fill the neighborhood and then hit a smoker and blow up that's the way I see it. <laughs> but that's not happened yet. But uh, yeah, my surprise was that they built this neighborhood knowing the pipeline was there. Or before, they, they built a neighborhood knowing that they're going to put a pipeline through the neighborhood. And I thought, well, no, <laughs> don't do that. That's stupid. No. Now they have to fly a plane over because they don't fly it over the countryside that often. They do yeah. it a lot less frequently because I can see on the radar app where they're going. They just fly over the city and land, and that's got to cost a lot of money, and it's because they're worried. Uh, Brian, uh, Friday night at supper time at 5.55 or 5.50 p.m., we were about to have supper, or deciding on supper. We didn't. We were plan, did not have plans for supper that night. We are working it out, and uh, the power went out for four and a quarter hours or so. Wow. That doesn't happen very often, and I tell you, it threw a monkey wrench into our supper plans. We ended up sending the kids to Domino's Pizza outside the outage area. Yeah, of course. Because, <laughs> the, yeah, the, all the rest, you can't order takeout because you have to go outside. Because it was a pretty big area. It was a large swath of the quadrant of the city, I would say. And, yeah, it was a big outage because you could see all the different things listed. But to, it, it was just kind of weird. We didn't know what to do with ourselves, you know? My family all thought... Gee, I, I hope it doesn't get too cold in here. And I'm thinking, people, I have not been running the furnace for over a month. The furnace has not been on in a month. Yeah. It's completely heated by the sun and the, you know, it's warmer out. It's not warm and we're below normal so far this year. But you know what happened? Kids, kids came out of their homes and into the <laughs> field behind my house. There's a park, a pipeline, and a field, and a school. All kinds of kids. Thousands of kids. And then the sun went down and you could see the street lights turn on when the power came back and they ran, Brian, they ran as fast as their little legs could take them. They yeah. ran as fast as they could back to their homes and screamed <laughs> in glee. And then it was quiet. There was nobody around after that. It's so just, it sounds like a flashback to our youth when yes. you know we only had two TV channels, so we would actually leave the house. But no they internet. were out there playing sports and happy. They were happy, Brian, <laughs> but not as happy as when the power went back on and they fled. They fled. <laughs> I, I wish I had footage of it. It was just, they all screamed, the power's back, and they went off into the directions like rats fleeing a ship. Anyway, uh, BC Hydro sent me an email saying that they are going to 
well, first of all, they have EV chargers in the province of British Columbia, which I've used, and they were wonderful, although some of them were like a fast charger that only did 25 kilowatts, and usually the lowest you would see is 50, and you'd want to see, you know, 250 for a Tesla. Yeah. You're filling up at 250 kilowatts uh, at that rate. So some of them were disappointing, but they are, because we, my family, we just sat down and watched a couple documentaries on the Alaska Highway. I don't know. We were just killing time uh, after lunch one day. So we were, it's kind of a remarkable story about the Alaska Highway because it was built in 1942 because they were worried, the United States was worried about Japan invading Alaska because Alaska protrudes way out into the ocean and they could use that as a bridge for invading. And they tried flying, I think, 38 flights um, based, they set up little airports in Canada so you could hop over them to get to Alaska. And I think 27 of the planes crashed into the mountains. They didn't do well (laughs) getting over the mountains in the Yukon, which is is close to the Alaska border. So they built this road in five months, this two, I think thousand kilometer road in, in five months, it's not a paved, but it is gravel. And the army did this, and there was a lot of racism involved because the black soldiers were giving terrible jobs by their Southern commander and the uh, white uh, soldiers were given better jobs operating equipment, but it was hell and uh, people died. Equipment was abandoned. If you go along this highway now, there's lots of history to it. Canada ended up buying the highway back so that uh, they didn't feel bad about it or something. I don't know. <laughs> I <didn't> know. <laughs> so that they could use it and it's paved now and it's a popular destination, but not for an EV. It's one of those places where you definitely can't take an EV. But what's interesting is the Northern Territory in Canada, I think it's... Uh, Yukon probably and they have a lot the, their government there has a lot of chargers set up just you know there's the population of of the whole territory is like a small town like small city it's not very much they have hardly anybody there so it's it's amazing that they even have done this and we have you know a lot more population here a lot more industry here and we're not doing that anyway that's already set up in the Yukon. So BC Hydro is, uh, they have two highways that go up there. Uh, we don't have any that go up there and aren't where we live. So they have two highways that go up in there. One is the Alaska Highway, and they are putting chargers on it now. So that's very cool, and it opens up the opportunity for our American friends, if you want to go up to Alaska or our Alaskan friends to go down to the lower 48, that will be possible in a year or so. But they're already starting that, and that's very cool. And also, uh, you know, we talked about Fort Nelson, which is up there. It's on one of those roads because it has uh, been evacuated by uh, forest fires last week. Now they're coming back. But, I mean, that's a problem if you want to evacuate and you can't get out of town. Uh, with your, uh, say, you have a Ford F-150 Lightning electric truck. So there's uh, a report on the uh, Canada's charging infrastructure as a whole. It's up 33% in the last 12 months. Now, where I'm seeing it, and there's one instance like this on the way to your cottage at the lake, is that they're popping up at dealerships. And I have, you know, several dealerships here. Dealerships, dealerships are not usually the greatest place to get a charge because sometimes they don't like you there. You know, their anti-EV yeah. as a whole and the, you know, head office has made them put in this charger and they're angry and they park in front of it. They ice it, as they say. I think there are, you know, plug share sort of indicates where they are and they're working. And it, it, the problem is it's just one charger. So if you're going across town, you're going on vacation and you're stopping somewhere and you're going, you know, a mile somewhere to get a charge and it's taken, that's not good, especially if it's networked or if someone gets there just before you. But yeah, some of these new chargers at these dealerships actually have an app where you can, it'll tell you when the charger frees up, which is nice. All, you know, every, every charging company has a good idea. I wish they would combine them all and do something like that. I like Tesla is always, you know, warning you of when the, uh, the chargers are free. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, you can already go almost everywhere in North America with chargers, but uh, it just improves every year. So that's great. Uh, Okay, so from The Guardian, uh, a new survey suggests that a majority of U.S. voters support climate litigation against big oil companies, and almost half would back even more aggressive legal strategy in the form of criminal charges. So we know that criminal charges eventually happened in um, 
with Volkswagen and their Dieselgate scandal, and, and Volkswagen executives uh, actually went to jail. So um, this is perhaps uh, in the future for this. And, you know, related to that, also from The Guardian, so there is a criminal case that has been filed in France against Total Energies, and this has been filed in Paris by eight people harmed by extreme weather and three NGOs. The plaintiffs believe it is the first such criminal case filed against individuals running a major oil company. These are big companies, but of course there are human beings making these decisions, and often these decisions are to delay and obfuscate. And uh, much like the playbook from the tobacco companies who did the same thing, they pretended that, uh, you know, smoking cigarettes was safe. So, uh... The public prosecutor who received the file now has three months to decide whether to open a judicial investigation or dismiss the complaint. So this is not uh, going to court yet, but uh, we'll find out soon. And, you know, this could set uh, some kind of a precedent for this going forward. Um, According to The Guardian, there's already 40 existing U.S. lawsuits against major oil companies. And, you know, we talk about these occasionally on the show. Uh, Fighting them in court is a great way to do it. These charges are based on civil charges such as tort law and racketeering protections. And uh, uh, last year, it's the Consumer Advocacy uh, Advocacy Nonprofit Public Citizen who also proposed filing criminal charges. So criminal charges are maybe next on the docket for, you know, these oil companies. So it was the group Public Citizen that teamed up with Data for Progress to survey 1,200 likely U.S. voters And those numbers are pretty good. You know, people are definitely, we're banding together against the oil companies. And the problem isn't so much the fact that they dig up oil and sell it. The problem is that they've been lying to us about the effects of it. And as we know, they've they've known for decades about the possible dangers of this and did their best to hide it. So that's where the problem lies. The world still runs on oil, um, but that doesn't mean you have to lie about it. I'm not a, a lawyer, as you know. But you're not. No, I should be. I'd sue everybody. (laughs) I'd sue that damn pipeline plane for wrecking my peace. It's interesting that they're going after the CEO and the directors of the board of the oil company rather than the company. And uh, if they are successful, you'd have to think that would put a chill in other CEOs and directors and maybe they wouldn't act so poorly. Well, this is one of the problems that we're having is that all the major oil companies are still expanding their operations. And if they were worried about going to jail, maybe they would stop doing that. You know, every time this happens and it's happening more and more, and we're big fans of litigation against oil companies uh, when they're doing bad things and just governments, sometimes governments are sued like Montana kids in Montana sued the government last year and, and won because their constitution stated that they have a right to clean uh, air and environment. Okay, Brian, The this is from the Energy Mix, a wind farm in southwest Iowa. There's been a lot of tornadoes in the United States and uh, a lot of people dead and a lot of damage done recently because it was a terrible wave. I think the, um, the damage to tornadoes is significantly up year on year so far. A wind farm in southwest Iowa was actually hit by one of these tornadoes directly. And because every one of their dog is a tornado chaser these days <laughs> with all kinds of cameras that are great digital cameras and in fact they were flying drones into this I, I i've seen some of the footage it's amazing you know they're coming up with a new twister movie my my son was a big twister fan because it scared him at first and then you know jaw scared me at first when i was 10 and then i became my favorite film of all time then he, he used to watch it all the time when he was little and now they're coming out with a sequel uh, and of course it's been like 20 years since they made twister or something or more than that and the effects are a lot better, I'm sure, but they'll never compare to the to the actual video footage that we get fed on a regular basis of tornadoes in the United States, because, you know, a drone shot is just spectacular. It looks fake almost, you know, when you yeah. watch these shots. Well, maybe they can buy some as stock footage and, <laughs> and put it in the new Twister. Maybe. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they 
if they cut that in. So a wind farm in southwest Iowa suffered a direct hit from a very powerful tornado that crumpled five of the massive power-producing turbine towers, including one that burst into flames when it hit the ground. You know, sometimes, I don't know why. I'm not going to speculate on why. But I, I imagine the something overheats when it starts spinning fast. They're 600 feet tall, these turbines. They're not the biggest ones in the world. You see really huge ones out in the ocean, which produce a lot more electricity, of course, too. But these, and I didn't know this, they have blades that feather. We talked about a cyclone somewhere off the coast of Asia. I can't remember where. I'm being very general about it. But like a year or so ago, I was amazed that, you know, these uh, offshore wind turbines, they could feather their blades so that they could handle any weather. And this one did fine. But it also produced a heck of a lot. Because unlike a tornado, it's, you know, a cyclone, like a hurricane, will stay there for a long time and produce powerful winds. Yeah, and so by feather, you mean they're able to adjust their orientation? Is that what you mean? That's right. Just sort of adjust the angle so that the wind has little effect on them. So, you know, like the edge of it would be going into the wind instead of the the surface at an angle to, to push them. So they don't have as much power. Well, apparently these on, these um these onshore ones do the same thing. And it's not something that gets talked about a lot, but that's what they did. And they said, the experts say, this is very rare. They actually do very well in tornadoes. They're designed to, for tornadoes and lightning and windstorms and things like that. Anyway, we have a clip. The munchkins call me because a new witch has just dropped a house on the Wicked Witch of the East. Okay. <laughs> I I embellished that clip with some sound effects because sure. they didn't have the sound effect of the wind turbine going over. But that was Storm Chasers calling it. The windmills disintegrating. They're not windmills. Yeah. Windmills no. are something completely different. Wind turbines, please. Just pet peeve of mine on the show. You know that. Yeah. If there's one thing we can accomplish by 2030 on this show is that please call them wind turbines, not windmills. Yeah, but experts say, like I said, these are rare. Several of the turbines at Mid-American Energy's uh, company's Orient Wind Farm recorded wind speeds of up to 100 miles per hour as the tornadoes approached. That's 160 kilometers an hour. That's a lot of wind that would damage most things. I always thought they had brakes on them, and I think they, they might have brakes too, but also... You know, because they're, yeah. I don't know what the, the wind speed is, but it's not 100 miles an hour that they can take. They'll shut down long before that, which is too bad. But, you know, you have to keep them working because there's moving parts in these things. Yeah, and of course, a tornado is different than a normal wind as well because it's it's circulating in a spiral. Wow, but 100 miles is pretty powerful. And uh, just before the turbines were destroyed, they said in a statement that was what they achieved, and this was unprecedented impact on our wind fleet. We have uh, operated wind farms since 2004, the company said. And while there have been isolated incidents of tornadoes or hurricanes damaging wind turbines, fortunate, fortunately, such occurrences are extremely rare. Wind turbines are built to withstand high wind speeds and severe weather like tornadoes, hurricanes, and lightning strikes, but few structures are designed to withstand a direct hit from a powerful tornado and five of them went down. Designers will likely look at this event and all the great footage of it, including the spectacular cinematic drone footage, and uh, revise the standards and, and learn from it. So that's kind of a good thing that they were there, and no one got hurt as far as I know, so as far as that particular area. Yeah, and of course, solar panels probably, you know, generally do fairly well in extreme weather, but again, you know, a tornado would take down uh, solar panels or sometimes hailstorms, but only if the hailstones are super huge, like baseball sized. Right. And they can be. And Calgary has got so much hail in the last 15 years that they've started seeding the clouds, you know. Yeah. And they, they, they're like five planes go up and, and just go around and people tweet this. And uh, it's rather remarkable. The insurance industry pays for it, which is a brilliant yeah. idea uh, when you think of it, because it makes the hail smaller. If it falls yeah, they're out of trying the sky. to sort of start the hail falling before it goes too big or something like that. Yeah, because the updrafts, of, you know, keeps throwing it up in the air where it gets cold and frozen and comes back down and up and down. And then I'm no weather expert, Brian, but I wish I was. Let's dip into the mailbag, shall we? Uh, we got a letter here. It says, hello, Brian and James. I'm not sure if you've heard of Sense Home Monitoring System. 
I have not. Uh, we are in our house and are just going to, uh, through the setup process, I'm finding it interesting to see the load on our power usage. I can see that it will be a bit of work for the system to learn what is being used in your house. Our solar is not installed yet. They're getting 10 kilowatts. That's a big system for a house, Brian. And uh, what it is, it'll be integrated with the system as well. So that's interesting. I love, I'm a big fan of... Like when my, <laughs> when the power went out, my house did not function because all my smart devices needed rebooting and, and they didn't like <laughs> being offline for four and a quarter hours. I still have to go look at some lights on the stairs that aren't working uh, all this time later. But yeah, no, I'm a big fan of that. And it's, you know, most people don't think about the electricity that they use in their home. That's great. I, I like that. And, you know, more, in, this is the future because we will have the grid integrated with our homes, right? We'll have perhaps our EVs powering the grid and getting paid for that or just, you know, backing up the grid for a few minutes or a half an hour. There's lots of different ways and we'll be, you know, managing demand is part of the new system of electricity in the future because we'll, we'll you know, the grid will turn off our air conditioners if it needs it or, you know, raise the set point or something like that. We'll have to approve that. It's not going against our will. But, you know, water heaters that have tanks in North America here, we have tanks. So that can be turned off in the day or, you know, at night. You're not going to have a shower necessarily. And the water in there will still be warm. I hadn't heard of this before. Yeah, the Sense home monitoring system. I had a look at the website. It looks really interesting. As you know, about a year ago, I upgraded the service in our house, the electrical service from 100 amp to 200 amp. And at the time, I tried to get, you know, quotes to do a smart panel because there's smart electrical panels you can get where each individual breaker is can be connected to the internet and you can basically monitor. Is that right? Wow. In, yeah. From the breaker. That's what a smart panel can do. But it's still early days and nobody around here could kind of do one for me. But this thing that he's talking about in the letter, it does something similar, but it's much simpler. It connects to your panel and sort of turns it into a smart panel. Um, it's all connected to the internet and it, it monitors your overall electrical use, but it can use these kind of uh, algorithms to eventually identify different um, appliances in your house. So it doesn't know what's plugged into your panel, but it can use the software. It sounds like it can kind of eventually figure out, like every appliance has its own signature, right? So I imagine if, you know, if you run the dishwasher every day at five o'clock, it'll eventually learn what that is. And, and then through the software, then you can monitor how much power your uh, dishwasher, for instance, is using. So yeah, this looked really, uh, really great. Great alternative to an expensive smart panel. Your son's an electrician. Do you ever bring this up? Yeah, the, it. I I thought of that because uh, yeah, you need a, a certified electrician to install it. So if I if I ever did it, I would uh, wait for him to be available to to put it in and, and save. Do me you a few bucks. find you talking with future things that you know about that your son may not know about? Because I find that with my son in engineering is like, you know, have you heard about sustainable concrete? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. He doesn't know. He's, yeah. he's in the present. He's not thinking yeah. about, I want them to think about the future because I know, you and I know the world is changing. And yeah. uh, one thing that I wish for my kids is that they are aware of that. And they may not know exactly how it's changing, but boy, it is changing. Yeah, well, because we follow it every week because we're interested, but also because we do the podcast is, yeah, I'm constantly amazed that people generally are in the dark about all of these things that we talk about every week. Well, we'd love to hear from our listeners. Thanks for that letter. Please contact us by email at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail online. We love that. Speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. If you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button. Always wanted to say that. Smash yeah. it. Just smash it. Smash it. You can subscribe, too, if you're so inclined. It doesn't make much of a difference these days. Our podcast runs on support for the listeners. You can also donate in your show notes. Lots of stuff in your show notes there. Yeah. Thanks for the letter. Always appreciate it. Okay. So James mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I, I came across an article and thought it was kind of worth talking about again, maybe with a slightly more uh, content here. But uh, the Chinese state-owned company Costco... This is not to be confused with Costco, the, the discount supermarket kind of chain. Costco is a big shipping company in China. It's, it's the largest liner carrier in China. They have hundreds of container vessels. 
and they have an electric one now. And and James mentioned this kind of in passing kind of quickly uh, a few weeks ago, but I thought this was super interesting. It has begun service. It's um, a container ship that has 50,000 kilowatt hours worth of batteries. That's, uh, you know, like a thousand cars worth of, uh, of uh, electric batteries. But I thought the most interesting thing about this perhaps was that they can add more batteries if they want because it's a container ship. And guess what you can put in containers? You can put in batteries. This is like what grid storage batteries are right now. They're essentially shipping containers full of batteries. And people are using them for grid storage. So if they want to add more juice to their uh, you know electric cargo ship, they just put on more uh, containers full of batteries, so it can go up to 80,000 kilowatt hours of storage from the standard 50,000. They have 50,000 kind of permanently installed, uh, but then they can add another 30,000. So um, this is uh, saves approximately 15 tons of fuel if they're kitted out with the full uh, 80,000 kilowatt hours. And, and uh, you know, so they're saving 3,900 kilograms of fuel for uh, every 100 nautical miles. This is going on a regular route. It's about a 300-kilometer route from two different ports. This is not transatlantic. It doesn't have the range for that. Um, maybe someday that will come, but for sort of coastline or inland port to seaport type of shipping, this looks, yeah, totally great. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, the, the email was from Bob. And Bob, I can't remember where you're from. I'm not going to speculate because, you know, I'm getting senile, but uh, thanks for that letter. <laughs> I noticed you have the word Tesla in your email address, so or one of your email addresses. You probably own a Tesla, so we, we know that much about you, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's interesting, and I think that's, I look forward to the next one. You know, how quickly will the next one come? Because uh, is this an experiment? Are they testing it? Is there any problems with it? Or is it like said, whoa, this is a great idea. Let's get on this. Because there are short shipping things going on in the world, yeah. especially in China. And it, it is kind of the first of its kind. But the fact that it's already in service, like this is not just an experiment. There was no lab report, uh, press release. Yeah. It was just, here it is. It's going. What do you think? And it, it's already in service. So certainly it makes it possible uh, to do more of this in the future. Climate change and small island states. They are hailing a court victory, an ocean court victory. Again, not a lawyer, Brian. Wasn't aware yeah. that there was a marine court. Ocean but the, court. There is a, a marine court or ocean court or something should, like that. Uh, start a sitcom called Ocean Court. <laughs> <laughs> we like the love boat, but stupider. Uh, <laughs> a global marine mar a global maritime court ruled that greenhouse gases are marine pollution. This decision is important for small island nations. They are threatened by rising sea levels, obviously. If you want to find someone who cares about climate change, find a small island nation whose sea levels are rising, and they tend to take it more seriously than us landlocked idiots in the North America. The court's opinion is advisory, but it sets a precedent for future cases. Countries must do more than what the 2015 Paris Agreement requires to protect the ocean. The ruling creates a legal duty to monitor and reduce emissions, and small island states, um, they feel ignored by global climate talks. Obviously, they sometimes get to speak, and everyone sort of leaves the room. It's really one of those frustrating things about COP conferences. So they feel ignored by climate change talks sometimes, and so they see this as a significant victory, and the decision may influence other international courts' rulings on climate obligations. Major polluters like China, though, they were opposed to the tribunal's authority to issue this opinion. I always bow to the authority of Ocean Court. <laughs> Can you get speeding tickets in Ocean Court? Can you get parking <laughs> tickets, you know, for dropping anchor somewhere? I dropping don't know. Dropping anchor somewhere. It's a lot of jokes. There. All right, so... From Electric, China threatens tariffs up to 25% on imports in retaliation for EU and U.S. tariffs on EVs. And this was inevitable, of course. This is essentially a trade war at this point. The U.S. is moving up to 100% tariffs on uh, Chinese EVs. It also actually includes solar panels and, and batteries and medical supplies and stuff as well. So it's not just EVs that the U.S. is imposing these uh, massive tariffs on. So, of course, China is uh, talking about retaliating. They're, the EU has threatened to increase their tariffs. They haven't quite done it yet. So uh, part of this 
from uh, the Chinese government is maybe to kind of press the EU to maybe not do it, because, of course, if they do it, uh, China will retaliate. Also in late March, China's Ministry of Commerce filed a complaint to the World Trade Organization targeting the U.S.'s Inflation Reduction Act, saying it is unfair in terms of world trade. So, you know, this is, is going to be more courtroom fodder. This is going to become the, the court reporting podcast. Maybe we should have an offshoot with with lawyers. (laughs) Hey, there's an idea. (laughs) They'd have to have a sense of humor, though. You know, lawyers don't have a sense of humor. The uh, EU has, I think, a 10% tariff now on EVs. And they're going to to 25. They're they're hoping to move it up to 20 or 25. Yeah. Uh, I think 10 is a no wonder they're threatened because 10, 10 is not going to stop China. But there's been a lot of ink spilled on this issue since this has come out because you're balancing what, you know, the negative view of it is that for political reasons to make happy the auto manufacturing states, which are swing states in this upcoming election, U.S. um, presidential election, you know, Michigan, make them happy by putting tariffs because this is a big threat. However, you have to balance that with the fact that China is making a lot of cars and they're making them cheaper. They're making them better. They own the whole supply chain from the mine to the uh, you know, make the batteries and everything. They're able to do it that way, and they're doing it well. They're designing them well. They look good. They have good tech in them that works better in some cases than other, you know, the legacy automakers. And meanwhile, you know, China, or not China, Japan, Japan is just you know, the, the companies there, Toyota, you know, uh, Subaru and some others have all said, we're going to make internal combustion engines even a little bit more efficient. So don't worry. Yeah. There was another major story about Toyota this week, how they're continuing to work on their internal combustion engines. And, and most companies have stopped development because we don't need any more development of internal combustion engines. But there's just Toyota grasping at straws, man. Grasping at straws. But the other sort of aspect of this is that these tariffs that China is proposing will affect, in all, in many cases, internal combustion cars. Like, this is part of what they import into China, is American internal combustion cars. So those are going to fall off eventually anyway. So, you know, the tariff maybe might not have that much effect. Uh says, we know, you know, China has gone very big on electric vehicles uh, anyway. So maybe they don't even need the tariffs to keep out the U.S. gas-burning cars. You know, China would come in and and dominate, and the legacy automakers, it wouldn't take long for them to be in big, big trouble. And, you know, part of me says, well, you screwed it. You, you had this opportunity, and, you know, 42% of Chinese vehicles that are bought now are electric, fully electric, uh, are new energy vehicles. There's a few hydrogen in there. But, yeah, it's it's worth it. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. Speaking of BYD, the Chinese automaker, it has reached 100 dealers. 100 dealer stores in Brazil. Brazil, as you know, Brian, is a country of 218 million people. That's about two-thirds of the United States population. Often not talked about and discussed, unless they're holding a World Cup or something. Uh, But it's there. And it's a, it's a big, big country uh, in the Western Hemisphere. The factory and population, I figured out, it's about half the rate of Tesla locations in the United States. Right. Now, but Tesla, as you may know, having owned 1,600 of them, have been around for a while. <laughs> They've been around for uh, some time and had a chance to do that. BYD hasn't started uh, its entry into Brazil until a few years ago, and now it's really taking off. I think if you check back in a year or two, that things are going to be, you know, at par with Tesla or better even. No, a hundred dealer stores in Brazil. That was super surprising to me. I, I knew they were making inroads into South America, but that's, that's amazing. They're doing it fast. And, you know, the population of Brazil is highly concentrated in a small number of areas. It's not spread out quite as much as it is here in the United States uh, down south. Uh, Inside EV's headline states, Nissan's future EV plans always feel permanently in flux, but the next-gen Nissan Leaf is supposedly coming soon. The rumors of his death has been greatly exaggerated, Brian. They said, most pundits said it wasn't coming back, that it was going away. And it's going to be on sale March 25th. 
or March 25th, March 2025, made in the UK and Japan, but not in Tennessee, where my Nissan Leaf came from in 2013. Interesting. So that may be a nod to passenger cars, regular cars not selling in North America very well and crossovers. Yeah. However, they say it's going to be based on this prototype they released, I think, early in the pandemic, and it's showed kind of a, like a higher car, kind of a small com subcompact SUV type of thing. I mean, the, yeah. the Leaf now is kind of like, not that different than what they call small compact SUVs. Like it's, it, it rides a little higher and it's got a fair bit yeah. of room. It's bigger than my Bolt, for example. Yeah, everything's becoming more SUV-like, even if it's something I would sort of call a hatchback yeah. They're getting kind of taller and more SUV-like. That's the that's what they're doing. And then in North America, anyway. So India added an incredible five times more solar in the first quarter of 2024 compared to a year ago, or even the previous quarter uh, at the end of last year. A record 10 gigawatts. Now, a gigawatt, that's a lot of power, obviously, about the power of a nuclear reactor. And that power is about a million homes in the United States. But I was thinking, Brian, that in India, they don't have 2,500 square foot homes. I think that's about the yeah. average house size in the United States, which is yeah, tremendously big. Like, I think my house is too hard, big to clean sometimes, and it's only 1,700 square feet. But yeah, it's um, they wouldn't use as much electricity in India, I'm guessing. Um, someone can correct me on that, but, uh, you know, I don't think there is uh, huge consumers of electricity as much as we are with our, you know, it's, it's, the hope is that India will get air conditioning and the middle class will not suffer because it's, you know, the climate is getting harder and harder for them. Yeah. The massive heat waves have been very deadly in India. From Bloomberg, how EVs are resetting the global EV market. China's second largest automaker, this is not BYD. I think this is, oh God, SAIC? Uh, China's second largest automaker is bringing electric cars, not the combustion engine, but electric cars to Egypt. So they are going to manufacture them in Egypt, and they will be scaling up over five years with the goal of producing cars with 65% locally sourced parts in Egypt. Not combustion engines, EVs in Egypt. Well, that's got to tell you something. Ride hailing services, very popular there, are likely to be the target market for these cars. And manufacturing, like I said, will scale up. It's going to take three to five years before this gets going. And it's time for a CES Fast Fact. In 2014, China sold 75,000 EVs and hybrids. And they exported half a million cars. And if you fast forward 10 years to 2024, China's selling more EVs than any other country. 9.5 million cars delivered last year. So 75,000 10 years ago and almost 10 million now. Wow. In only 10 years. That's and crazy. I'm willing to bet that 99 out of 100 people have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Like only the people that listen to our show. <laughs> yeah. And even then many of them are drinking heavily because, you know, it's a drinking show. People, oh, yeah. whenever a, I say certain game. phrases, they drink. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's basically why we're popular. From PV Magazine, uh, construction begins on Sweden's largest rooftop PV system. PV means photovoltaic. It's the type of solar panel that produces electricity from the sun. Um, Byron, I won't say his name, some guy has started working on the Nordic <laughs> region's biggest rooftop solar project, and it is a 14 megawatt array that will span the rooftop of a very big warehouse. We, in our province, we have 10 megawatt solar farms, but solar farms, like sprawling solar farms in the countryside. And this is going to be one big warehouse with something that's 40% bigger than those, Brian. It's pretty amazing. And such a good potential that doesn't seem to be tapped as much as we'd like. Yeah, and I just want to mention, too, there was a story this week from Electric Aeromine Technologies. I think we've talked about them before on the show. They have these kind of bladeless wind turbines that are also meant for the roofs of large warehouse buildings. And you put them all on the edge of the warehouse where they have the most kind of prevailing winds. The, there's no obvious blades in them, but it sort of funnels the air into a, you know, a, a turbine. And so, yeah, there's tremendous potential for solar on roofs. I mean, 14 megawatts is insane to get that just off the roof of a building. But they could add some of these, uh, you know, wind turbines as well. Yeah, they're kind of like the shape of a fridge or something, kind of a, a tall cube. Yeah. 
Yeah, arrow mine technologies, and you, they put them along the roof. They weigh about a ton, but yeah, they just have a certain shape that funnels the wind. And it takes advantage of that turbines. on the corner of the roof or something like that. And they're quiet and there's no vibration. That's something you worry about with wind turbines. Uh, I don't know if this is going to take off or not, but they're saying that you get more electricity than you would from a solar array of the same amount of money. But then I'm also thinking, hey, you're only using up a small amount of room. Why throw some solar panels on there too and do kill two birds with one stone? Do both for sure. But don't kill the birds with wind turbines. I was going to say that. That was the obvious thing. <laughs> this doesn't have any moving parts, so I, I don't know. It would probably kill something. Maybe a bee. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration enacts a law banning the import importation of Russian uranium. That's important because Russia has a certain type of uranium that is popular in some nuclear reactors which are located in the United States. So dead monkeys are falling from trees in Mexico. Why? It's a brutal, brutal heat wave. They're setting record temperatures. My climate-happy son was telling me that some parts of the world have peak temperatures in May right now. And actually, Mexico is one of those countries. And yeah, I've already forgotten why, but he explained it to me. It has something to do with weather patterns and um, our versions of monsoons in North America. So monkeys have been dropping dead out of the trees as the savage heat wave has intensified in that country. They're howler monkeys, and they're falling like apples, this quote says. And they were in the state of severe dehydration, and they died within a matter of minutes. That's from the New York Times, if you want to read more about that. Per capita emissions since 1990, Canada is one of the highest per capita emitters in the world, with in Canada... Saskatchewan, which happens to be where Brian and I grew up and are currently living, is the only province to increase their per capita emissions since 1990. We've increased them by 30%, Brian. Doesn't that make you sick? How ironic that the clean energy show comes from basically the worst place in the world in terms of per capita emissions. But we will say that we have solar panels on our roof and this is fully solar powered, a beautiful sunny day. Yes. Right it's now. It's not our problem. It's not our fault. <laughs> We're, not doing our our fault. We're doing our best. Uh, neighboring Alberta, home of the oil sands. They reduced their emissions by 15% during the same period. Like e even, you know, Satan has done something better than what we have. It's yeah, crazy. It's bizarre. Uh, battery power. Tesla's battery storage installations for 2023 more than doubled uh, the 2022 volume. It's up by 125%. The division's profit is nearly quadrupled. So Tesla is suffering with car sales right now. But... They're, you know, I would think that would free up batteries, you know, because they have, they make some of their own batteries. Uh, and if they're selling this and they have contracts with battery suppliers, well, just throw them into the, the utility storage. These are big things that we were talking about that power the grid. Yeah. And they make these battery grid storage systems in the U S but there was an announcement recently that they're opening a factory in China to do that as well, to do grid storage batteries, which again, go in these shipping container like Things. And China's going crazy with, uh, you know, grid batteries as well. They're storing solar from the day and putting it into the peak in the evenings and into the night. Uh, 120 Fahrenheit in Pakistan this week. That is 50 degrees Celsius. And I've said several times on the show that I vacationed in Death Valley for a day during a heat wave and it was 50 degrees Celsius or 122 Fahrenheit. Uh, and I would get out of the car our air conditioned Prius at the time and yeah. look at a site and do things. But 10 minutes in my skin was hurting because it was windy as well. And it was like reverse frostbite. It was painful. And these people are living in it in Pakistan and they're not very many people of air conditioning or shelter or any respite from this. No. And if, if your air conditioning had died in your Prius, I would be dead. Brian. Dead. I would not would be, be dead. I would, I would be a carcass rotting on the side of the road, completely picked over and a few bones remaining. That would be my existence because yes, it was scary. It was you, your, your senses were on a heightened thing because you know that there's one air conditioner away from death and my God, uh, you'd think a lot of the fragile people in India are, are dying, the elderly, the sick, and so on. On Monday, the information.com, 
reported that the on the going rate for iron-based LFP batteries in China was dirt cheap. It was only fifty-six dollars per kilowatt hour, which is incredibly cheap. It used to be one hundred and fifty or something like that. You know? Yeah, we were waiting for it to get below a hundred, and now it's down to fifty-six. This is in China, though, and it's severely challenging Western battery makers, and they're saying now. This is like a week ago. Oops, we were wrong. They're only $47 a kilowatt hour, 16% cheaper than we even thought after a closer look. Wow. I don't know what to say. That's just, it's something that we'll keep an eye on. It's very interesting times for batteries. This is uh, from Bloomberg. Finally this week, China is spewing less carbon into the atmosphere for the first time since the pandemic ended, signaling that the world's biggest polluter may have peaked emissions more than half a decade before its own deadline. According to new research from Carbon Brief, uh, China's CO2 emissions fell by 3% in March after a surge lasting 14 months that followed the lifting of zero COVID controls, showing the country has the ability to peak emissions imminently. That's not definite, but it's possible that China has peaked its emissions. We always, our governments here were in our horrible province, always blames China. Look at China, look at what they're doing. Yeah. They're building coal. They got lots of coal. Well, those coal plants aren't being used very much, and the Chinese government is paying them just to exist for droughts and for, you know, heat waves as backup power. And our per capita emissions are up 30%, and China may have hit its peak. And, of course, every country will hit its peak of emissions eventually and then start heading down. Uh, but can't happen soon enough. Well, that's our show for this week. You can contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Around social media, we are Clean Energy Pod. And there are videos of our show on TikTok and YouTube, including some special content not featured on the podcast. If you're a fan of the show, and I don't know why you wouldn't be, uh, the Clean Energy Store is uh, linked in your show notes so you can wear our hats, shirts, mugs, even request things that uh, are odd put our logo on them rate and review us on apple or wherever you're listening to our show on itunes that helps us we thank the people who've done that and we'll get to reading your reviews soon and you can donate with paypal if you like if you're new to the show hey thanks for coming remember to subscribe on your podcast app my podcast app is going dark uh, you've been using google podcasts and now i have to switch to something else i'm peeved off google has oh, this no. reputation for bringing in something good and then killing it that's all they do they bring in things that kill it they don't have no respect for life uh if you're new to the show please remember subscribe with your podcast out because we do this every week maybe we'll take a week or two off in the summer and yeah but we have fun doing it see you next week see you next week <laughs>